hit it. Bada sir. bing, bada bam. Welcome to this week's Baking a Mystery, Baking a Murder episode. Listen, it's like practically midnight for me, so this is going to be one of those chaotic, just a weird bamboozling story. If you guys are not watching the visuals on YouTube <laughs> or Spotify, we've got Wei Wei here, we've got my fiance, we have Hello. Dan Dan, Hello. and we are going to be doing the pancake art challenge. So it's technically baking, not really. And I'm gonna tell you about the wildest story that I have recently heard, and that's saying a lot. Like literally, I see so many wild stories in my life. This is actually a Chinese short story that I'm going to link the sources below. This author has a couple of other different short stories, but the story was so good that my fiance kept talking to me about it, and I just had to share it with you. Like this is not gonna be a play-by-play -play because his short story is in Mandarin, so this is like my fanfic version. But these are also one of those moments where I wish I spoke Mandarin because he my fiance said this was one of the best stories that he has ever read. A okay, lot of let's it. not go that extreme. Okay. I thought it but was. But like in the past month? Yeah. It's good. Okay. I just, when I read it, the story was really, really good. So I don't know how okay. well you're going to do. Yeah, okay. I will be judging. I feel like I'm a lot of it <laughs> got lost in translation. So that makes me sad. I wish I could read it too. So with that being said, I'm going to start making the pancakes and we're going to get into the story. It all starts a year ago. Matthew started telling his wife a little bit of a story. I feel like this is not well cleaned. What's the last thing we some cooked? extra flavor. Yeah, some sort of, <laughs> yes, oh, <wow>. precisely. <laughs> so Matthew starts telling his wife a story. He never really planned on telling her a story that night. The conditions were just a bit too perfect. The rain was falling. It's softly pounding on their windows like a little visitor trying to get in. The dishes from dinner are piled in the sink. Do they care? No, they don't. They're just trying to have some alone time, some cute, romantic, marriage quality time. Even Matthew's wife's soft laughter is just warming this guy's heart. So he feels like he's melting into a little puddle of comfort and he can just, hey babe, do you wanna hear a story? But here's the thing, Matthew regrets telling his wife that story. Because a year ago, he had, this is a year ago, it's a flashback. Mm -hmm. She was curious and she kept asking for more details. And for some reason, Matthew could not stop himself. He just kept going and going. And something in her, something in his wife told her that the details all felt a little too real. They were all a little too alarming. Her blood started to run cold. Her palms were starting to get clammy. And Matthew, he kept trying to tell her, honey, this story is fake. I made the whole thing up. Honey, you have to believe me, please. The whole thing is completely fake. But she just looked back at him, eyes filled with fear. She looked scared of him. He had no idea, Matthew had no idea that his wife was gonna jump up from his lap, snatch her phone off the coffee table, run into the bathroom, lock the door, and as he's pounding on the door and the rain is starting to pound harder on the windows of their little house, the house that they used to share together, it was all going to be gone. Because he is writing all of this from jail. Mm. So do you want to hear what he told her that night? Oh, he's angry. Hey, you've been working out. Have you been working out? Prove it. Every day. So this is the story that he started with. He said, my name is Matthew and I'm 42 years old and I'm a suspense and thriller author. Listen, this guy has always liked suspense ever since he was a kid. It's not just about getting somebody's heart racing. It's not just about getting their adrenaline kick started. Suspense at the end of the day is all about logic and reasoning to make sure that the whole story from beginning to end makes sense that there's no plot holes there's yes. nothing and simone and i we've been married for many years and a lot of my peers a lot of my friends other novelists other authors well you can see their writing in their relationship no, you can see their relationship in their writing, you idiot. <laughs> okay? It's, you know, they're the type that say, when you've been married for this long, you know, you just kind of deal with the other person. But not Matthew. Matthew loved Simone, and she loved Matthew. They had a really good relationship. She has always been a steadfast supporter of all of his work. Did you know that she was his first loyal reader of all time? Read up every single word that he would throw onto the page, and trust me, there were so many bad ones before that he even had an amazing story. Like for every amazing story an author has, there's probably 16 stories that never made it past their partner, never made it past their Simone. In addition to writing, Matthew has some other hobbies. Some interesting hobbies. Like what? He likes reptiles. Do you guys like reptiles? 
it's a bit of an unconventional Not hobby, really. right? I mean, reptiles like lizards, snakes, they're cold-blooded animals. He said that they just kind of speak to him. The reptiles come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and each one fascinates him to no end. Let me tell you, okay, I'm just gonna start talking as if I'm Matthew because that's how the story is told. I've even converted one of the rooms in our house and I've even dedicated it to these reptiles. Do you know how hard it is to build a large ecological tank in the room to simulate the environment of a tropical rainforest where these reptiles thrive? It's very fucking hard. And however hard that you think it is, double it. It's that hard, but I want to provide my pets with a natural and comfortable habitat, right? So I guess it just, it kind of fit into my quirky little writer category with my bizarre hobby, but it wasn't always like that. In college, I actually studied bioengineering, which comes in quite handy now, but I just never thought that this would this would be where my life is. Like, this is really weird, but here I am. I'm a really lucky guy. Even when I first met Simone, she's pretty skeptical about my obsession with reptiles but she slowly started coming around. And after we got married, we decided to not have kids and instead we would raise our little reptiles together and it was honestly the best time of my life. He's saying, you know, he married his wife, Simone. They didn't want to have kids. So now they're just raising reptiles in this room that he has converted into a reptile room, okay. which I don't know, what would you guys do? Like she's a 10, but she has 25 <laughs> reptiles in the room next to you. And she's obsessed with them. Bye. Really? You don't like reptiles? Why? What about it? It just reminds me of insects. I don't oh. like frogs. I, ah, frog! Frog! Is, oh. Frogs are amphibians. Oh. Oh. <laughs> smart guy. Such a smart guy. Anyway, this guy is living his life with his f***ing reptiles, right? Mm -hmm. And he would say that anytime his writing deadlines come close, you'd have to turn in a manuscript and he's scrambling at his desk. He's like going over stacks of unorganized notes, brainstorming, drinking coffee like it's water. And Simone would watch from the doorway, bring him food, and take care of his beloved reptiles. Like he honestly couldn't ask for a better partner. He just wished that he hadn't ruined it that night with his stupid story. It was near midnight. Mm. He was done with work for the day. They were cuddling on the couch, observing one of the frogs. And Simone sighed and said, you know, I, I used to be so scared of reptiles before I met you. Maybe she felt stupid in that moment. Cause you know, why would a big, tall, powerful human with access to a smartphone feel scared of a tiny little lizard, mm -hmm. of a tiny little, you know, snake? And so Simone casually asked, come on, honey. Matthew, there's gotta be some random animal that you're scared of for no reason at all. He thought about it for a moment, and then an animal flashed into the front of his mind. Actually, there is an animal that I'm kind of scared of. I'm kind of scared of sheep. What? <laughs> sheep? Why? They're so docile and kind of, they're fluffy. Well, Simone, sheep's eyes are very strange. Are you not sleepy? Do you want me to tell you a story? So Matthew stood waiting for Simone's answer while he maintained eye contact with the lizards and something about the vertical pupils just gave him comfort. She's like, well, that sounds mysterious. Okay, sure, tell me why you're scared of sheep. Well, the protagonist in this story, mm -hmm. the, the hero of the story, his name is Matthew, but that's your name. Yeah, I mean, it's just so it feels more immersive. I want you to really get into the story. Here we have Stephanie telling us a story about Matthew that's <laughs> telling, telling another, story another story to the wife of, of himself, of someone like named Matthew. <laughs> Man, this is it. wild. Okay. What's real life? I don't know. <laughs> so the story goes like this. My name is Matthew, and ever since I was a kid, I was into suspense. I loved it for logic and reasoning. My dream was to join the police academy and become a detective. And since I was a kid, I always felt like my future was bright and it was gonna be easy. I was going to become a criminal detective. But of course, reality came crashing down on me when I was 17 years old. My dad sent me to the college entrance exam. And before I went in to take my exam, my dad stopped. He held me by the shoulders mm -hmm. and he looked deeply into my eyes, deeper than he had ever looked into my eyes in 17 years. I felt like he could see my deepest wishes, my darkest secrets. I feel like he could really see me. Like it was a really unsettling feeling. Like why is he making me feel so vulnerable? Like this is my dad. Mm -hmm. I was so confused. 
Maybe my exam was an emotional moment for a parent, as in, I'm getting older, I'm gonna go to college and leave the house. But finally, he broke the silence and the intense eye contact and said, you're gonna get good grades and enter the police academy, okay? Mm -hmm. I have to admit, it was a bit strange, but I did have an exam to get to. And I thought that my dad was just hyping me up. He's like, you got this, right? Mm -hmm. So I go into the exam, I kill it. I do so well. And when I get out, I'm rushing out the door and I'm scanning the crowd. So there's like a crowd of family, friends, and parents. And I'm like, where's my dad? Listen, my dad always waited for me after a big exam. I would see him holding his little bike handle steady with his hands. And just the sight of him, any stress, any stress that I was lingering from the exam, it would just wash away. He gave me comfort and I would squeeze past the group. And it's like my dad had this light shining down on him and I would, I would get to him and tap him on the shoulder. I would jump onto his little back seat of his bike. Let's go dad, let's go, let's go eat. And on the way home, dad would ask him how the exam was. And I would humbly respond, oh my God, it was the fucking easiest thing ever. The whole exam was so simple. I think mm -hmm. it's for idiots. And then I would laugh. And dad would laugh and say, you know what? Try to be more humble, son, you know? But I didn't care. I would just kick my legs and feel the cool wind rushing past my face. The ride back home was fun. We would bike up, we would bike downhill, and on mountain roads, on dirt roads, like we literally went everywhere. The wheels would turn and turn, and over the years, the shoulders of the front seats, like the handles, right? Mm -hmm. They slowly became super loose. So every time they're going downhill, it's fucking rattling. It's like, duh, 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 oh, right? No. <laughs> it felt so shaky. But somehow, when his dad was on the bike, it just felt steady. Like mm -hmm. even though it was shaking and it was rattling and his teeth were clattering, it felt steady in a sense. And he needed that after his college entrance exam. But dad was gone. He wasn't there waiting for me. I pushed through the crowd and I'm like, dad, dad, where are you? Nowhere to be found. Hmm. I'm like, okay, it's fine though. I mean, I'm sure he must have gone home first. It's okay. I'll just go jokingly yell at him for not being there to pick me up on his bike. But at least the exam went well, right? Well, when Matthew got home, he rushes through the front door. Dad? He's not there. His dad had disappeared. His mom sat him down and said, I don't know what to say, but last night your dad was acting strange. He was acting extremely irritable and aggressive. We fought a bit, and I, I think maybe he was very angry and he ran away. I think we should maybe give him a few days to cool off, and he'll probably come back, right, after he's calmed down? Mm -hmm. I mean, the reasoning is strange, but what does a 17 year old know about marriage? So both mom and I knew that we shouldn't talk about it because this is a pretty small town in China. I mean, it's gonna be really shameful for your dad to walk out on you guys for a fight. Like it's, it's just not a nice thing, right? Or to be gone without explanation for days at a time. So they just kept quiet. They try to be like, oh, he's on a business trip. But a few days later, there's still no sign of the dad. Hmm. Matthew doesn't get it, but slowly confusion turns to anger because he's like, why the f would my dad abandon us? Like, I don't even understand. He's supposed to be reasonable. He's stable. He's a family man. There were no signs that he would walk out on us. None. This guy is honest. He's down to earth. He cared for me and my mom. A few days pass, no news. Mom asked me if I was going to find my brother to tell him what happened. I said no. For some context, Matthew has a brother who's five years older than him, and he was born with an eye abnormality. He had moved out for work, but he was never, he never really reached out ever again. He kind of just cut the family off. Nobody tried to talk to him. I don't know, it was weird. Did it have anything to do with dad being gone? Probably not. So Matthew didn't reach out. And time continued to do what it does best, which is pass. And after a month passes, Neighbors start noticing that the dad is gone. And of course, being the enthusiastically, annoyingly helpful neighbors that they are, they can report it to the police mm -hmm. on behalf of the family. Hey, just wanna let the police know, our neighbor's friend, our neighbor's husband is gone, he's missing. You should look into it. You should look into it, find out all the tea, and tell us, because mm -hmm. we wanna know. So they went just above and beyond, right? Describe the dad's appearance, his height, his weight, everything to the police. And that is how Matthew and his mom found themselves in their front door, looking through the little peephole to see a policeman on the other side knocking. 
Hi, I'm here because somebody reported your father missing. This is just standard procedure, but I, I need to be collecting some fingerprints in the house to make sure that he's not found later. We need to log his disappearance into the system. All right, are you ready? So then it's gonna go first with the art. Can you tell us what kind of art you're inspired by? Yes, Mona Lisa. Okay, Mo oh. you're gonna draw the Mona Lisa right nah. now? Hmm. I'm thinking about my favorite yeah. emoji that I use when I text which one? The lip biting Anyone? emoji? Yeah. <laughs> is it so... Mm. It's oh. the dedication for this me. This is kind of cool. It's the shaking for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally, it looks really hard. It is. Yeah. You can use both hands, you know? Oh my god, I swear to god, I feel like he did the same drawing last time. No! <laughs> no. Wait, he might have. The big guy, big guy face emoji. Huh. This is abstract art. So, what was I saying? Oh yeah, we need to log his disappearance into the system. It seemed standard, but the police come back the next day. Why? Did they find the dad? No, but they did find out the dad's secret. So, he drew some boobs first? Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> That's inappropriate, then. Eh? No. That <laughs> is Trust me, it's <laughs> so dirty. dirty. This is nothing so dirty, I promise. It's, dude, it's getting hard. I bet because you drew something inappropriate. You know what I mean? Yeah, y'all dirty. It's so thick. No, there's no way. I think what you okay. need to do is open the cap, pour it on there, and use the spatula to flatten it up, kind of fill it in. It's too fragile. Honey, I don't think this is the vibe. Guys, this pancake mix is definitely not what it's supposed to be. This is gonna be the world's most dense fucking pancake. Right, it's just gonna be a pancake. The police come back the next day. Did they find his dad? No, but they did find out the dad's secrets. See, that's the silly thing about disappearing. Your secrets will never go with you. They stay, and it's easier to find out your secrets because you're no longer there to guard them. 12 years ago, something very bad happened. In a neighboring city, mm -hmm. a family of five was massacred in their remote house. The family was isolated, they had no enemies, there were no witnesses to the crime, and the police at the time concluded that the murderer was just a random passerby. What kind of psychopathic serial killer just walks by a nice little house in the remote mountainside, goes in, kills the family, I'm talking women and children included, nobody was spared, the attack was brutal, it was done with a knife, it was the entire annihilation of, an, of a family unit, and it was random. The moment of truth. <laughs> What is this? I guess we're gonna go mm. back into the story, okay? Yeah. And the case is only gonna be harder to solve because the police have no leads. I mean, it's not even someone that's connected to the family. It's completely random. Mm. So the police gather as much of the fingerprints on the crime scene that they can, and they kept them for 12 years. The case was cold for 12 years until we came here yesterday. And we took your dad's fingerprints. <gasps> and the secrets of his past came back like a roaring fire that was no. gonna just fucking take down everything in its path. Your father's fingerprints were at that crime scene. He was the killer, he was the murderer. And you wanna know what Matthew's feeling in that moment, don't you? Hopefully you never feel this in any part of your life, so it's not like a spoiler alert, but Matthew said, it felt like, it felt like someone took a hammer to my heart and went at it over and over again. The feelings, the memories, they rushed back like a tsunami that was determined to flood every single part of my brain. I was five years old when the crime took place. Five. My dad was working. He was out on business trips. He would come home after a business trip, grab my little hand, his hand always felt so oversized in mine. He would lead me to the mountain to play and I, not once did I know in the past 12 years that the hand that I was carrying, the hand that I was holding on to, was covered in blood. Because my dad had blood on his hands. Mm. This dad that I knew was an illusion of my family. My world was shattered. And the only way that it was reorganized back together was with this one truth that was the only important thing above all that my dad was a killer.
He killed a family of five. He came home to his wife and kids without a single guilty thought in his head. He continued to live life as if nothing happened. As if his mind wasn't plagued by the late night reruns of the brutal crime. Like, what? I mean, I have to admit that he had a spectacular poker face. He had a great disguise. Nobody would ever suspect that my dad was a killer. He was a family man. And then what? For 12 years, he duped us all all to run away when I'm 17 years old? Yeah, okay, so you can tell that the truth shattered Matthew's whole life. He couldn't even join the police academy after this because when your dad is a suspected killer, they're never gonna accept you. You would never rise in the ranks, you would never become detective, you would always be known as the killer's son, and people would wonder in the back of their minds, is homicidal tendencies genetic? Will one day this guy kill me too? What if I piss off this guy one day? So no, Matthew did not go to the police academy. He went to college, he started studying bioengineering, and he was the kid in school with a secret. He was so stressed for the exams, but also he was the kid with a dad that was listed as a fugitive and had a warrant out for his arrest. His family was broken. Matthew's family life was like a wine glass that had a tiny little crack, and then the rest of the glass just started to shatter around that little splintered area until it all crumbled onto the ground in a pile of, of little glass pieces that it was impossible to pick up without cutting yourself. So after graduation, my mom falls sick and dies. And my brother, well, he never reached out. He was technically missing too, I guess. Not really, like he's gone, but missing because he doesn't talk to me. Does it count if, as missing if he doesn't want to be found? I just wanted to start fresh. So after graduation, I moved to a big city and I tried to work. My life felt really boring, I'm not gonna lie. Like I was going through the motions. I was writing my novels, raising my reptiles. Everything was just plain Jane every day. Day in, day out, same stuff. And then I met a woman named Simone. It was 2009 the best year of my life. We got married. And the days went on quietly until 2011, the police found a bone in the remote valley in the mountains of my hometown. A f***ing bone. According to police forensics, the local climate that factored in, the degree of decay factored in, the body was said to have died about 10 to 15 years ago. That meant that That's... this person, whoever it was, died sometime between 1996 and 2001. My dad went missing in 1997. And the bone age calculations showed that the person was between 30 to 40 years old at the time. My dad was 40 mm. when he went missing. The <laughs> body was now nothing but a skeleton. And of course, fingerprints are naturally useless when you're just a skeleton. But this is the 21st century, 2011. DNA technology has been rapidly developing. Nobody cared to get my dad's DNA. They had just grabbed his fingerprint when he went missing. But they did have my blood in the system. Mm -hmm. And they ran it. They ran my DNA with the bone. And it turned out that the bone that the police found were father and son relation. Hey. It was my father at the foot of the mountains. So the dad goes missing for years, mm. and now he's dead. Listen, Matthew knows what his dad did was wrong, but when the police brought him to ID his dad, well, the one bone that they found, it was, it was still hard. I mean, he still remembered that the clothes that the dad wore when he dropped him off to exams, the last time he ever saw his dad, he was wearing this striped t-shirt. And there it was. The bone fragments were wrapped in, this, in these fragments of weathered clothing and you could still see that it was a striped shirt. You could still recognize it. It was my dad. But that's the end of the criminal investigation because when the suspect, or I guess the killer dies, the shadow of the parents, it was all gone. Like, that's it, this is the end. The police don't care anymore, my mom is dead, my brother is gone, my dad is dead. There's no need to talk about it anymore, right? So I haven't told my wife, Simone. At this point, Matthew snaps out of his storytelling and he looks at Simone. So, what do you think of the story so far? Pretty, like, intriguing. Well, that's what Matthew asked Simone. What do you think, Wei Wei? Mm. He said, mm. <laughs> what, does mean? what does that mean? Then you want to try round two? Where's you want to try cap? a bite of it? Ooh, ah. it's it's like cinnamon. cinnamon. You don't like cinnamon. Uh. 
So Matthew gets back from his little storytelling and he says, what do you think of the story so far, Simone? And he could just see the shock on her face. Mm -hmm. Is it, is this true? Simone, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Mm. But, but I don't know much about your past. I only know that you were raised by a single parent, your mom, and she passed and your dad disappeared when you were younger. I knew that you were in pain whenever your family was brought up or when your past was brought up. So I never pushed you for more information. And now, now you're telling me this story and the main character's name is also Matthew and his father disappeared, his, his mom died. He studied bioengineering and later he becomes a novelist and raised reptiles and he, and he married a Simone in 2009. Like, that's me. That's when we got married. So this is your story, right? Like what you're telling me right now is what happened to you? Simone, this is all for you to have a more immersive listening experience, like a book. I don't want you to think about what's true and what's not true. Just focus on the story. And tell me, what do you think of the story? Um, well, you said that you were scared of sheep and then you told me this story and this story has nothing to do with sheep. And also, the dad in the story disappeared. The son and the mom, they only searched for him for a month. They didn't even report him missing. I don't know, it just doesn't really feel realistic. Like, four or five days without reporting, maybe that's reasonable. But a month? I mean, do they even like the dad? It feels, I don't know, it feels weird. Like, they don't even care. I mean, and also, the dad, I don't know. The, other than that, the story itself feels like there's a few twists here and there, but overall, it's a pretty straightforward story. The dad was a murderer, he vanished, and now he's found dead, and the case was closed. Matthew looks at his wife and says, You're right. That's because the story isn't over yet. What I told you is the opening, but you haven't gotten to the real twist. The father is not dead. And back into the story we go. Ever since I was young, I was into suspense, reasoning, and logic. I liked it, so it felt natural to feel pulled to the criminal investigation route. What's more suspenseful than solving a real-life crime that uses logic to outsmart the criminal? Are you kidding? There's no bigger thriller than that. But in our social and political climate, I couldn't be a policeman if my direct family members had committed serious crimes. So my dad told me, Son, I must die. The truth is, I found my dad after my exam. I found him near our house in the endless mountains. I remember that he used to take me up into the mountains as a kid. He would grab my hand mm -hmm. and he, he liked to study the plants. And I think my love for reptiles really started there because I loved catching the little lizards. I loved it. We even found a new trail on the mountain that nobody else would hike. We always climbed it together. It was, it was our trail. It was off the beaten path, if you will. So naturally, I found myself walking up that trail to the top. And there he was, dangerously on the edge of the cliff, staring into the sky. After dropping me off at my exam site, my dad had come here because he wanted to die. But he was scared. I started crying. I mean, I was only 17. Of course I cried. I asked him, why? Why do you have to die, dad? And he cried and he told me his secret. The secret that he had buried so deep for over a decade. One that felt like he was ripping out both of our hearts. But it wasn't what I thought. He said, on my way home from work, when you were just five years old and your brother was 10, my car broke down and I, I, I had to walk. I had to walk down the road looking for help. There was likely no help. I was in a pretty remote area. It was in the mountainside and it was nighttime. Like nobody was awake. And then came my saviors, this nice little family. They said, come on, man, welcome into our house. We've got a guest bedroom. We're going to make it nice and cozy for you. So I wanted to stay the night. It was predicted it was going to rain later anyway. So the next morning, I could get help from my car, right? I mean, it's a very simple plan. What are you going to do this time? You can't be doing what a school like again. What about like a star? A star. Okay. Yeah, he said, let me be oh, easy this time. Oh, easier? Mm-hmm. I think it was the water. I don't know what kind of geometry class you took though. Cause that don't be looking like a star. Just algebra. Patrick he said he's star. making Patrick star. He made Patrick star. Patrick star. Patrick star. Uh, he's trying the eyes. It's Patrick star. Patrick star. All right. Wow. All right. So the dad, the dad said, you know, it was the perfect plan. Well, nearly perfect. It wasn't all the way perfect. 
I was carrying a lot of valuables and cash because of work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to sleep too deeply because at the end of the day, no matter how nice, no matter how welcoming these people are, these are still strangers. I didn't feel that comfortable. So I cautiously laid down and rested my eyes. I didn't fall asleep. But in the middle of the night, the father of the house was standing over me with the knife in his hand. And I instantly knew what was happening. He was trying to rob me. I mistook his kindness. He was trying to dupe me. And I started feeling panicked. I started feeling scared. And then all of a sudden, I started feeling angry. I wrestled with the man. I grabbed his knife and I stabbed him over and over and over again. And after that, I started getting nervous. I started thinking, well, what about his family? Will they report me? Of course they will. They saw me. His wife is going to say, I killed his husband out of nowhere. Will they try to spin this story so that it wasn't self-defense? I mean, I guess it's not self-defense. My blood surged and it felt like all I could see was red. So I killed all of them. All five members. No women, no children were spared. I knew it was all over then. So I cleaned up as best as I could, but my heart was pumping so fast and so loud. I feel like I couldn't even think straight. Obviously, I left my fingerprints. I ran off, and from that day, I quit work. I started working as a farmer. I started working from home. And that was that. Now, mom is a bit of an interesting character, right? Matthew's mom, she never really cared that he stopped working, never really cared that he took a job as a farmer, which was a lot less pay. She just always believed in her husband no matter what. Did mom know? All Matthew knows is that the word murder was not something that would apply to their family. They're not criminals. They're not one of those types of people. They're not killers. Like in the mom's eyes and in Matthew's eyes, dad was a good man. He valued family. He loved us. He cared for us wholeheartedly, but he was starting to crack. We could see it. He would just have full force psychological breakdowns and he was coming close to losing his mind. He was ultimately worried that he was going to hold me back. And that was the biggest burden that he could carry as a parent. My dad knew that sooner or later, that with the advancements of technology, his crime would be found out. He was going to get caught. And it was going to ruin all of our lives. Listen, do I believe what he told me? I don't know. I don't think I should trust him with my whole heart. That's for sure. Whether or not he killed the family because they were trying to rob him, whether or not he broke into some random family's house and killed the entire family, I don't know. But on that cliff, I just had one thought. I knew I had to get him down. Dad was standing uncomfortably close to the edge and he was sobbing. He's wiping his face, covering his eyes. You know, it's, there's a steep drop right next to him. He's shaking violently and I'm, I'm starting to get worried. And I'm like, dad, please just like come down here. What are you doing? And it wasn't a choice that either of us would make. The ground unexpectedly started to shake under his feet and he's about to fall backwards off the cliff. So dad starts fluttering his arms like a baby bird trying to learn to fly. And I run up to him. I grab his arms just in time and my heart is pounding. It's skipping a beat. The rocks in the soil fall off the cliff. Do you want to know how steep that cliff was? I didn't even hear a sound. I heard nothing when the rocks fell. But I heard my dad at my feet, sprawled out, gasping for air, and he looked like he was hyperventilating. But at least he was safe. He was safe with me. He didn't have to tell me because I already knew that he was scared of death. In theory, my dad wanted to kill himself. You know, it was the noble thing to do. It was the bright thing to do. He was gonna kill himself so that my family could live in peace. He wanted to, I believe it. But when it came down to actually doing it, he didn't have the heart. And I can't be mad at him for that. So I take his shaking little hand into mine and I tell him, Dad, it's too high here. Let's walk down and see how high it is. Listen, kind of an odd thing to do, but maybe it was going to help distract the dad. They did used to hike together, so maybe it's that, I don't know. So Matthew starts leading his dad down the mountain. Your Patrick star is coming together real fine and dandy, I just mm -hmm. want to say. It's hard to make a pancake the way that Dandy shakes. Yo. It's okay, that's good. I Let me flip it. it. Flip it over. Patrick oh, start! Oh, oh, Patrick yeah. start! Crispy. Careful, careful, the leg! Oh. Flip it. We'll do a medical emergency. Oh! oh that's wow. a Patrick! 
So uh, Matthew starts leading his dad down the mountain. The dad didn't refuse. He just quietly followed behind as if he was still in a trance of sorts. He had to go around and slowly go towards the river valley. The way down was pretty dangerous. Like they stumbled, they climbed, they walked, they slid for two full hours before they finally got to the lowest point in the valley. And we looked up. See, Dad? It's so high that if you were to jump, it would have hurt a lot. Yeah, but what other choice did I have? So the two stand in silence. Well, not in silence, because the wind is passing through the valley. There's a river nearby, making an intense rustling sound. It was honestly pretty chilly. The whole thing felt terrifying, in a way. Why? I mean, everyone's safe. Is it because, is it because his dad just told him the craziest secret of all time? No, it's because he felt it. A shiver ran down his back. It started running through his body. He looked around mm -hmm. and he saw it. A sheep, not too far away, looking directly at me and dad, watching over us so quietly, like, like it was observing us, it was learning us, it was studying us. I don't like sheep eyes. Ever since I was young, I was especially tortured and traumatized by sheep's eyes. Let me explain. Most animals, they have round pupils like mm -hmm. us, like humans. Then you have, you know, the pupils of lizards where it's vertical, mm -hmm. like a little slit, like a snake. But sheep, they have horizontal, almost rectangular pupils. Their eyes feel like a mystery, but mm. not in a good way. They feel completely unpredictable. When you look at an animal and you look at its eyes, you can tell what it's about to do because animals, they, they're pretty predictable. You can tell when a dog is triggered. You can tell when you shouldn't be messing with that bear. But sheep, you can't. It's neither cute nor is it fierce. It just feels like they have no feelings. And the whole thing is so unsettling. When a sheep is standing not far away, quietly looking at you, and you don't know what it's thinking, right? Yeah. I'm convinced that when you look into a sheep's eyes for long, you're gonna lose control. Sheep's eyes are gonna make humans go crazy. But I, I'm not dumb. Obviously sheep are docile, fragile animals, but it feels like they can somehow control us. Like they can put humans in a trance and make us do whatever they want. It almost feels like they creep out the humans so much that inevitably the human wants to stop. They want to kill the sheep so that they don't have to see those eyes. Those eyes that are just analyzing them. Oh. So I look back at my dad and I don't know if he notices the sheep and if he did, he said nothing. And I walk up to him, I give him a big hug. I realized that after he had just confessed to the world's craziest thing, I didn't say much. He probably needs to hear that I still love him, right? That I don't hate him. So I hug him and I say, Dad, you killed someone, but I'm not scared of you. Nor do I hate you. You will never be a burden to me. Maybe other people will see you as this evil person, but for me, you're just my dad. And you're the best dad that I could ever have. I wanted to be a policeman. Yeah, I did. But that doesn't mean that I have the strongest sense of justice. Like, I don't hate you for what you did. I just liked suspense and logical reasoning. I can pursue other paths, you know? This is not the only passion of mine. I don't have to be a police officer. Don't worry, it's not the end all be all. If my beloved father is a criminal, I will give up any of my original career choices without any hesitation and I will stand by you. I know what I'm saying is probably not the right thing and I know it's five, five bloody lives that you took. But I was selfish to even want to be a placeman to begin with. I didn't even want to do it for the greater good. I just wanted to do something that I liked. And with that reassuring, I don't know, question mark, reassuring conversation, Matthew doesn't wait for his dad to respond. He instead crouches down like a hunter getting ready to pounce, picks up the largest rock near his feet, and calmly walks over towards the sheep. The sheep with its horizontal pupils that were still watching, quietly. 
It watched as Matthew approached. It watched Matthew lift the stone. It didn't even bother to move.、Hmm. It just watched, and he couldn't take it. He smashed the sheep's head again and again until it died. Why? I don't know. Maybe he felt the need to prove to his dad that he too was a horrible person, capable of bloody things. Or maybe the sheep's eyes really do make him feel like he needs to do something homicidal. I don't know. But the sheep's blood was splattered everywhere, and it even flowed into the little river nearby. So he wipes his hands off, and he makes eye contact with his dad, who seemed shocked, amazed. The emotion is kind of hard to tell. He didn't know what I was doing. He didn't know why I did that. He just knew that after he confessed, he had to help me, the way that I would soon help him. So he came up to me, and without a single word, he started grabbing at the sheep. I started grabbing, and we dragged the sheep's heavy, limp body into the woods. It took a while, but we made sure that nobody would stumble across the sheep. And even if they did, it's just a sheep, right? What are you gonna do? Call the police about it? So after this, I look at my dad and I said, "In the religious context, a sacrifice is replaced by a sheep. That's why we call it a scapegoat."、Mm, scapegoat. That means symbolically, that sheep that I just killed, it's your scapegoat. It pays for the sins that you've committed, and now it's dead. We can go home. Your sins are dead. Matthew didn't know if his dad fully believed this, but I just know that his dad was in a mentally weak spot. He was vulnerable. He was literally about to have a full-blown psychotic breakdown that he could not even be pulled from. And Matthew was giving him a rope, albeit a rope that didn't really make logical sense, but a rope nonetheless. A rope that said, "Hey, dad, don't feel so guilty because this sheep died for you. This sheep is taking care of your sins." And slowly, the dad starts feeling more comfortable, and maybe my words did help. I told him, "We'll talk about it later, Dad. But first, let's go. Trust me, you're gonna be fine. We'll all be fine." And with that, I took my father's hand and started climbing up the mountain with my dad, along the same path that we had already been through so much. And my dad used to take me up the mountain many times, and he always took my hand and he always walked in front of me. But this time. I walked in front of him, and when we got home, I learned that my mom had already known my dad's secret. But she loved my dad no matter what, and she knew that she couldn't do anything about what he had already done. So that night, when I walked back into the house with my dad, she burst into tears. This is her husband, her killer husband, her murderer was still alive, and with that, the three of them stood. Hugging and crying and holding on to each other, we were just glad he was alive. We were just glad that he was still with us. But I think we also were crying because we were grieving what our lives used to be, and it never will be, because the next day, my father became a ghost. He could no longer go outside.、Mm. He could no longer see the light. Even if his crimes were not exposed for the time being, we would have to cancel his entire existence in advance, just in case, so that we could be separated from his crime. If in five years down the line they find out it was him that killed the family, they could say, "Well, we haven't seen Dad in five years. He ran away from us."、Mm-hmm. Was this the best solution? No, but it was the only solution that they could think of. They just had to take it one step at a time. Show us your Patrick, bruh. Wow! Wow! <laughs> wow! That's a Patrick. That's the world's that's best. That's Dennis. Our work, guys. Give a round of applause, y'all. Woo! All right,、wow. wait, wait. You want to try your hand at this? Hello, hello. All right. Our... Spray that baby up with that oil. My mom and I, we spent nearly a full month cleaning up Dad's things, bit by bit, and we started spreading rumors that he had walked out on us. Rumors that the neighbors were more than happy to spread. I tried to wipe the house clean of his fingerprints. Dad even started wearing gloves around the house. And if somebody ever walked by or even came by, Dad would go rush into the cellar, slam the door shut, and hide. This was torture that he could never bear. Dad was somebody that loved to go outside, and for him to stay locked up inside with no socialization—I mean, it was gonna be rough. But what could they do? 
A month later, the neighbors finally called the police and the police were very suspicious. They came and they took any fingerprints that they could find. Listen, I was careful when I was cleaning up the fingerprints, uh -huh. but the police were more careful. They found a fingerprint above a door frame and it was my dad's. So all that planning, all that prepping, everything that we tried to prevent all of this, it failed. It was game over. Dad was caught. Later, the police came by to take a sample of my blood. Mom and I made sure to be there so that the police didn't suspect that we knew. We played the part so well. I mean, in the beginning, we embodied the shock, the disbelief, and then slowly, we let it turn to hatred and just ignorance. Hatred for the police for shattering our blissful lives. Hatred towards our dad for ruining everything. In addition, we even told the police that dad had been acting really strange before he vanished. Because, well, he had. We made it seem like he knew what he was doing. He knew that he was gonna get caught and he wanted to run off. He didn't wanna go to jail. So the police decided after some time of this intense surveillance on the house that the dad was unlikely ever gonna come back home. So they stopped visiting as much and um, Matthew went on to go to college. Mom died and Matthew went back and had a funeral for his mother. Mom dying was pretty tough. Not only was Matthew grieving, but dad couldn't even go to the funeral. But also, he no longer had a house that he could stay in to hide in. They had to sell it. For four years, dad had hidden in mom's house. So what could I do? I took dad out to the city and I let him get a glimpse of mom's funeral. And then immediately we went to get him plastic surgery. The surgery was successful and my dad did recover quickly. And listen, it's not one of those movies. It's not like his face is completely different now and unrecognizable and he can go anywhere, right? It's not like that. But at least it's not so obviously my dad. The surgery was a game changer. Like he could at least go out in the sun. He could blend into the crowd. He could maybe even get a job with a false identity. But he could never be near me while we were out because the police might see and they'll know it's him. So at that door of the surgery clinic, I wrote my phone number and my address on a note. I handed it to my dad and I said, if anything ever happens, you call me. And we parted ways. What are you gonna make? Pikachu. <laughs> Pikachu? Pikachu? What? Oh, wait, let me see. Uh, that seems hard. That would be cool. I don't even know what Pikachu looks like anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. I see oh, it. Oh, I see it now I with the ears. Right. Yeah. I see it now. Oh, I okay. see it. I remember, that's all I remember, like the edges. Yes. Wow. That's good. That's good. Hey, that's better than Patrick's <laughs> Yeah, that's really good. That's pretty good. And that was so fast. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. They were both going to begin their lives in the same city without each other. You know, they were going to act like they didn't know each other. It was 2001 when this happened. Matthew went on to get a job and all day he just stared at these microscopic organisms. And my dad used the identity of a dead workman to enter the factory business. By factory business, I mean he just worked in a factory. He chose the right one though. He was always a multitasker. And my dad's job, he worked with corrosive acids. They were so strong. So slowly, every single day, he would slightly burn his fingertips in the acid to corrode his fingerprints. So he did this habitually. Imagine your wounds are not even fully scabbed over and they're not healed yet, and yet you're dipping your fingertips into acid that can disintegrate a table. He's trying to get rid of his fingerprint completely. Oh. He's burning them. Dad and I kept in touch. I mean, I know all of this because we would write letters to each other. At first, we just mailed them to each other's residence. And uh, for some reason, the damn police officer, Lou, started to come and see me again. From time to time, he would just pop in and say, have you seen your dad? No, my dad is dead officially. And what else do you want me to tell you? I don't know what to say. Like, what do you want from me? I'm just checking in, making sure you're okay. Okay, well, thanks, I'm fine. So dad and I got so paranoid that we started exchanging letters the old fashioned KBG way, <laughs> okay? I would sit at a noodle restaurant at a specific seat, I would eat the noodles and then leave a letter taped under the table. My dad would come to that same noodle shop a couple hours later, sit at the same table, at the same chair, order a bowl of noodles, and before he left, he would take the letter that was taped under the table. 
This went on for years, and it was hard. Our other favorite thing to do was climb our favorite mountain together, but opposite mountains, or sometimes the same ones. But we would climb, he would climb, and then we would get to the top and we would pretend to look out into the scenery. But we would just be looking at each other. The wind blowing in our faces, the sharpness of the air. We would stare at each other. Okay. Wow. Yeah, this story feels like a movie. Yeah. That looks good. That looks pretty cool. Ah, there you go. Wow. Okay, so you want to flip it quick though. So right now? I don't want that yeah. to chill for a second. Yeah, yeah. honey, let him okay. do his thing. All right, all right. Don't be micromanaging. All right, all right. <laughs> so then the wind would be blowing in their faces. They would stare at each other and they would think back to that fateful day where they were on top of the mountain and he had confessed to killing five people. But on one of those occasions, Matthew looks back and he saw that Officer Lou was on the fucking mountain, following him closely behind. What? I couldn't let him know that. I couldn't let him know that I felt panicked. So I just kept walking. And thankfully, he didn't notice anything. He didn't see my dad. Because yeah, my dad got plastic surgery, but if you still look close, you can see his face. Sure, his fingertips are gone, but DNA is an eternal thing. Technology is advancing more. DNA was going to be a big problem. So that is how my life was until 2009 when I married Simone. Okay, flip it. Oh! Wow! Whoa! That's kind of Sounds cool. Wow. Wow. That's actually I'm amazed. Wow. Wow. That's like mango. <laughs> yeah, it's so cute. I'm Wow, I impressed. actually see it. Wow, I think you won. Wow, it's a tough Damn. competition here. Why, are you trying to go next or something? <laughs> <laughs> like, this guy is so, <laughs> he's so competitive. So that was Matthew's life until he got married in 2009 and he married Simone. So not long after marrying Simone, he took her onto his favorite mountain and uh, he just told her, this is my favorite mountain, right? I want you to see it. But when they climbed to the top, my father was there and he watched from afar. Simone had no idea, but later my father said to me that he felt Simone's soul. He felt like she was gentle, just like my mother. He said so that he was very happy for us. That's a way of him introducing his wife to mm -hmm. the dad. And he said that night he ate an entire extra bowl of noodles for good luck. Bro, this is so sad. <laughs> and I burst into tears at that. I just wanted to be around my dad again. And in 2011, it seemed like it was my chance. My chance was finally coming. Officer Lou stopped snooping around. I started climbing the mountain again to see my dad in the crowd. And then one day, I couldn't take it anymore. I walked straight up to him. And he tried to pretend to look away, but he was confused. I think that's done. All right, sir. You want to mm. put it on? Oh, you want to show them? Grab the air. Oh, Grab oh, the air. Put it here. Put it down. Oh, Pikachu. That's so cute. <laughs> so <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> okay. Wow. Do you want to try? Yeah, I'll try. He's like waiting for his phone <laughs> right now. Oh yeah, Mr. Mango Butt. So anyways, the dad, he tried to pretend to look away. He was confused. And he got, Matthew got close enough so that he could see the panic in his eyes. The, what are you doing? The fear. And I grabbed him and I said, dad, the case is too old. The police told me that they're done investigating it. It's been closed. What? It's all over. Now we can go back to before. It's been a decade since we had a normal family life. This is the first time we can meet in close distance. Let's just go back to before. He looked at his dad for what seemed like the first time in years. And it was, I mean, it had been a long 10 years for his dad. His hair was graying, his hands were old and calloused. His, his face was sunken in with deep wrinkles. A rainbow. I thought you were doing the Mona Lisa. This feels pretty simple. You do it. <laughs> Continue. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So I couldn't help but throw myself into him and I gave him a hug. It's all over, Dad. You don't have to be afraid anymore. We can meet openly now. And from then on, Dad and I met openly and honestly as friends. We started hiking, climbing the mountains together. We were no longer father and son because we couldn't be. We didn't plan on acting like we were. Besides, there was no way to even go back truly to how things were. We had both started our own lives. I was married. What was I going to say? This is my vanished dad, wife, here you go. Father got a new job at a bookstore and he started dating a woman that worked there. The two weren't married, but they were partners in life. And like this, with dad and I, we were friends for another 10 years until he passed.
And in the summer of 2021, my dad suddenly died from an illness. I went to his funeral as his hiking friend, and for his last wish, his partner spread his ashes on the top of the mountain. Sometimes I thought to myself, well, at least the hardest part of my life is over. Sure, my dad could have seen a few more years, but it was better than if he had died in 1997, right? Dad was able to enjoy his life for at least 10 years because I told him that the case was too old, that the police had stopped looking. But that was a lie. That's just what I told him, and he believed me. It wasn't true. The police would never give up chasing fugitives that have been suspected of murder. The police stopped investigating because the case was closed. So the real Matthew disconnects from his story to look at his wife and he asks her, how do you feel? I feel like, like this is all true. I told you, Simone, stop worrying about what's true and what's not true. I, I don't know, I just, I never knew these things and you said it was just a story that it was fake, but soon after we got married, you did take me to the mountain. I, I didn't know that I had met your father that day. And there was a period of time where you went to this noodle shop regularly and you always went hiking alone without me. I mean, the details, they all line up and I feel like this is all true. And with that, Simone covered her face and her shoulders started to shake. She was crying. And Matthew put his arms around her and said, it's just a book. I just filled some gaps in my life with dramatic plots in order for you to have a more suspenseful experience. But since you care so much, I I'm gonna stop talking about it, okay? I'm not gonna st talk about it. You don't have to worry, it's not true. No, I think it's true and it's okay. It's okay, you can keep talking. There are so many things about your past that I still don't know and like, there's things about this story I wanna know. Like, why is the case closed? What happened to the bones found by the police? Was it the sheep? How could the police not tell the difference between a sheep's bones and a human's bones? Also, what is that weird religious scapegoat thing? Like, is it the sheep? Is it the scapegoat? Like, I don't get it. Matthew starts getting nervous and he looks at her and he hesitates and says, are you sure you want me to tell you? What? Yo, <laughs> another plot twist? I'm afraid he can't handle it. It's too late, like I, I need to know, you have to just tell me. And so Matthew did. There is some context to the story that is important to remember though. Remember Matthew's brother, the one that is five years older? Well at first the family was a family of four. You had us, you had the parents, the brother, and Matthew. The reason that I'm scared of sheep's eyes is because they have horizontal eyes. They're quiet and they're strange and they feel emotionless and emotional all at once and unpredictable. I've hated sheep's eyes since I was a kid. I've been scared of them. But my family didn't raise sheeps. The truth was, I was scared of my brother. My brother had an eye abnormality that was extremely rare. His pupils were not round, they were rectangular, and they were horizontal. So Matthew's brother had sheep eyes. And of course, in this social climate, you know, my parents had no idea how to deal with his abnormality. They didn't know how to shield him from the world. And honestly, I think my parents were a bit scared of my brother themselves. My brother liked to sit there silently and stare at people with those eyes. And even if you said, Matthew, what are you looking at? He wouldn't respond. He would just sit and continue to stare and nobody could stand it. All the villagers avoided him, and honestly, they felt taboo even talking about him, even mentioning his name. They just acted like he never existed. My grandfather was very religious, and he said in some cultures, goats and sheep were considered creepy because they were reincarnations of demons, and that's why they had those eyes. They seduced people into doing bad things. So I always felt like my brother was the devil. Everyone kind of excluded him, my parents too. So when he got older, he left the house, went to go work, and never really contacted us. I don't blame him. He never came back. Honestly, there was no news of him. He didn't come back until my mom died in 2001. Uh, hey. <laughs> oh, wow. Why does it look kind of inappropriate? <laughs> what are you saying? I but don't know. It's supposed to be a rainbow. Anyways, uh -huh. let's continue the story. 
Okay, anyways. I give up. So uh, he didn't come back until the mom died in 2001. That day, a lot of people came by the house. They were stopped by, they were dropping off food. My dad stayed shut in the cellar. I would bring him some of the food and water, but it would be days before he could stretch his legs and come out. But one time, I thought the house was empty. I went downstairs to deliver the food, and suddenly, I felt a shiver run down my back. I turned it. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. Get your ass out of here. And I just felt this unsettling look. I turned around, and there he was, staring at me, looking at me, blankly. And I was so scared. I thought that I could faint. My father was surprised. We didn't think that he would come back. I mean, he had been gone for so long. And that night, the three of us, my the dad. Brother, brother's alive, but brother came back for the wet, uh, funeral. funeral. Mm. My dad, my brother, and I sat around the table in awkward silence. My brother was wearing sunglasses to cover up his eyes, well, at least in the beginning, mm -hmm. and he took them off while he spoke. He said, I haven't been back for a long time. I miss you guys. I didn't expect that I couldn't see my mother for the last time. However, what's the matter with you, Dad? And he took off his sunglasses. Why are you hiding in the cellar? Why are you telling me not to tell anyone that I saw you? I jumped in and I said, oh, it's just all to protect Dad. <laughs> But shouldn't a killer pay with their lives? It's clear that brother had heard the rumors and I tried to tell him the truth. The whole story, it was self-defense and to this day, I don't know if he believed me. He looked at me with his sheep eyes and said nothing. And after my brother left, I took my dad to get plastic surgery and that's what caused it all. I didn't know if my brother was going to go to the police. I didn't know anything. Everything was going to go back to normal. It had to. That is till 2007 when my brother reached out to me again. He asked to come stay with me for a few weeks. I did not want this. I did not want him to, but I needed to make sure that he wasn't going to tell anybody about dad. This was my way of verifying that he was keeping our secret. So I let him, I invited him over. And then a week passed, extra slow. Listen, I made every possible hint to pass to let him know that I wanted him to leave ASAP, <laughs> but he didn't. He stayed and he stayed and he stared at me with those eyes. And one night, I'm feeding my reptiles when I heard some rustling behind me. And then a voice asked the same damn question that had haunted me from years ago. Shouldn't a killer pay with their lives? He's yeah. gonna kill, the brother's gonna kill his younger, Matthew. Cause he mm. killed the sheep and then he needs to pay for his price. Mm, okay. Up until this point, I tried to think about what the meaning of my brother's life was. Why was he born? I know it's selfish to think like that because okay. why are any of us born, right? But why was he born? What was his purpose? All he did was make our lives miserable and he always judged us. It's not even about his eyes or that he was born with an abnormality. It's the fact that he just sat there judging us every day of his life. Was he really put on this, on this earth to judge us? And I, I never had the answer. Maybe he was here to scare me and to torture me. But then it, it all seemed so silly, didn't it? Because in that moment in my reptile room, it's like I had missed it. It was like a big neon sign and I missed it all those years. Why did his eyes look like a sheep? Why does he have sheep eyes? It's not because my brother is the reincarnation of the devil. He's the scapegoat. Have you seen a goat's eyes? Oh. They look just like sheep's. And I turned around, and there he was, looking at me, staring at me, looking into the abyss of his horizontal pupils. I could feel myself moving without thought. I grabbed the rope and I put it around his neck. And just like that sheep that day, he didn't fight me. He didn't do anything. He just let me. And I pulled as tight as possible. Now, you have to remember, I was a bioengineer major, and most forensic scientists are originally in the bioengineering field. That's important later, because I clearly killed my brother in 2007. And then I asked my father for his old clothes, I put them on my brother, that striped shirt, I put it on my brother, and I decided that I was going to forge a corpse for my dad, one that would close the case so that the police would stop looking for my dad. If he was dead, or at least if they thought he was dead, they would stop looking for him. But first, age of the corpse. This is important. Usually it's determined by looking at the aging of the bones. My father disappeared when he was 40. My brother was 32 when I killed him. 
Eight years difference, it should be okay. The police did later determine that the corpse belonged to someone aged between 30 to 40. So it was good. The second thing that I had to worry about was the decomposition of the body. I had the means. I mean, it was like a sign from God. I had a giant ecological tank in my reptile room. So I buried my brother's body in the soil in there, and I tried to replicate what a body would look like after being there for 10 years. If my dad had been in the mountains for 10 years, his body would have decomposed slowly because of the specific temperature and the environment in that area. So I had to quickly decompose my brother's body. I had to make it a rainforest, tropical destination for my brother. A vacation, if you will. And remember that sheep that I killed? Well, it came in handy because I went back to see the decomposition of the sheep's bones and I could match them with my brother's until they were perfect. They were both my little scapegoats. God damn. <laughs> and when the results were finally consistent, I brought my brother's bones over and after two weeks, I couldn't wait anymore. I needed the police to find my dad so that he could be free. I gave an anonymous tip to the police and the police were quick. Everything lined up with the corpse being my dad's, but they wanted to verify, remember? Well, they had my DNA on file and the DNA was a familial match with my dad. Yeah, and while Matthew is explaining this, Simone interrupts and her face is like disgusted by her husband. She's in shock. I mean, she's, she's feeling rage. It's hard to tell what is the stronger emotion. And she's like, I, I can't, I can't listen to this anymore. Your father was a killer, but so are you. You're insane. I never thought that you would kill your brother. And in this house, was it in this house? In the reptile room, you killed your brother and then I married you. And I always trusted you and you kept me in the dark. I even, I even took care of your pets in that room. Does that mean your brother was in there the whole time? Simone, can you please calm down? Of course not. I have a headache. You're giving me a headache. This is all a book. Please, it's not true at all. It's all fake. It's, it's not a real story. <laughs> I just wanted you to feel more involved in the story, but you got so involved and now I feel bad. I regret it. Simone wasn't listening. She was muttering to herself. Oh my god, I, I got married to a guy who killed his brother and hid the corpse in the room that I went into without even knowing. Simone, you have to believe me. Snap out of it. I'm an author that writes suspense. This is my job. No, I, no, I, I can't trust you anymore. I, I can't decide whether to believe you or not, and I just don't trust you. And Simone reaches for her phone, jumps up, runs to the bathroom, locks the door. He runs after her and Matthew starts banging on the door. Calm down, don't do anything stupid. Open the door, Simone. Even if the story is true, it's 2021 now and the case has been closed for 10 years. There's no way to prove it. All the people involved are dead anyway. I regretted it the second that those words came out of my mouth. Simone cried out. So you admit it, it's true. And I could hear her calling the police. And that's how I found myself sitting with the police in my fucking living room and Simone was telling them the whole story while I sat there looking astonished and shocked and you know what, borderline annoyed. They looked at her, they looked at me and then they said, well actually they didn't say anything, they burst out laughing. Don't cry, Miss Simone, it's really just a story. Your husband really is a bit cruel though and not so funny joke, huh? He's obviously trying to scare you and he took it a bit too far but you've got nothing to worry about. Obviously, I regret it too, officers. I didn't know that my wife would believe me, but just out of curiosity. How did you guys know that I made it up when you heard the story? Um, well, we're police officers and for one, men in a family, you can tell when it's a father-son match and not brother-brother. So if your DNA was on file and your brother's body was in the woods, then it would be a brother-brother match and we would be able to know that. DNA evidence has come a far way and maybe you haven't read up on it, but we can do quite a bit these days. The police turned to Simone and they tried to reassure her, you know, ma'am, we really, we understand the back end of this and there's no way that this story is true. And Matthew interrupts them quietly from his chair said, but, but it, it really is a father-son relationship. What? It, it's a father-son DNA relationship. And I, I'm actually not done with my story. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna keep going, keep going, keep going. But, this is crazy. He said, let me take it back 10 years ago when I was a kid. 
I love suspense. I loved crime solving cases, reasoning and logic. So the day after I found that my dad, you know, had done what he had done, I took his blood. Why? Because I told him to give me some of his blood. Later, if his DNA was found at a crime scene, the blood in the system would be a match for me. And there's no way that a five-year-old killed a family of five. It would be a match for me. And whether the police believe it or not, maybe I would take the fall for my dad. I'd be willing to do it. But in reality, it's not my DNA on file for my name. It's my dad's. That makes sense, right? So the police are like, sir, can I get your DNA? And he takes his dad's and puts his DNA. So the next day, the police coincidentally came to get the blood and I gave them my dad's so that it would be on file. So later, my DNA was in the DNA bank, but it was my father's and not mine. And when they found my brother's bones decades later, well, it would be a father-son match because it was. It's just that the father and son were reversed, but that didn't affect the conclusion. The police didn't even know that I had a brother. Record keeping was bad back in the day and nobody in the village ever talked about him because it felt too taboo. I never thought it would work out so perfectly. Did I think that I was gonna kill my brother to be the scapegoat? No, but it worked. And when I was done telling my story, the police looked down at their laps. Simone almost fainted and I felt stunned. Before I realized what I had just done, I shut up, but it was too late. The police started investigating me the very next day. They investigated my background, recollected a blood test, and they watched me this time with Hawkeye. So it wasn't like the first time where they were just like, here, go to the bathroom, fill out a sample. They removed my soil from my reptile tank, but they found nothing abnormal. Because like I said, it was, it's a story. It's a fake story. So having said that, even if it's true, it's quite difficult to verify. I do feel bad for wasting police resources, but the police did get something out of it. They found out that some of my pets were precious wild animals. So I was sentenced to three and a half years for the illegal purchase of wild animals. And I'm serving my sentence in prison writing this. A oh. novel. Well, I finished the novel. It's a book, right? The end. And that is that story. Give me the crackers. <laughs> Bro, his his storytelling, his narrate like narration is incredible. Mm -hmm. Each story, I was hooked. So every narration you were hooked. I think after he explains how it's a fake and you know it's not really real he changes the scene to a i i don't know it just you, you make it makes you believe him more mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and keep believing and just keep listening really but, captivating i don't even know if this is real or not still yeah me either it you is guys... real you don't know no it is how do you know it's actually my, <laughs> my cousin's story huh wait wait you got something to say <laughs> <laughs> so i fucking hate sheep cuz <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Interesting. So do you guys think that it was a fake story he was telling his wife or it was the truth? I think it's fake. fake. But I just think he just wanted to like scare her or tease her. And he's an art, like an author, right? Like mm -hmm. technically. Mm -hmm. So yeah. He's mm -hmm. a good author. He's just a god tier author, you know? Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And that's just his passion. Like what would you do if your partner was telling you this story? I would lose my trust. Dude, that was crazy. Yeah. This is probably like the craziest BAM ever. Really? Like, like story-wise. Really? Yes. I was so confusing. Like in terms of like mm -hmm. the pacing of the narration, like... I will say the pacing was good. Yes. The pacing was fantastic. Yes. I'm not really like, I'm kind of over the slow burn phase. This was a slow burn, but the pacing was fast enough mm -hmm. that it felt good. How was the plot twist? I, I, if I had to count, I think there was at least four. This could be a good, good movie, huh? Imagine. No, for sure, for sure. It, it uh, reminds me of the invi Invisible Guest. Oh, have you seen it yet? Every time a story is being retold, it's, so it's a different story. Yeah. yeah. So every perspective, you just keep changing the perspective. And it's so suspenseful. Yeah, I love this. You gotta step up your book. Yeah. Sure. Gotta at least be ten times better than this. Okay, gotta times. go start writing now. <laughs> I'll see you guys um in a year. <laughs> okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this week's bacon a mystery, bacon a murder, and I will see you guys next Monday because we post three Mondays of the month, and then Wednesdays and Sundays are for rotten mango. <laughs> I'll see you then. Bye.